welcome to tonight's talk, which is the second in the Samuel and Althea Strom Lectures in Jewish Studies for 2006. Uh, I'm Professor Naomi Sokolov of the Jewish Studies Program here, and I have the privilege of introducing our speaker to you this evening. This is a genuine pleasure for me. I have known Anita Norwich for many years, both as a colleague and as a friend, and uh, I've always learned a great deal from working with Anita. On many occasions, I've enjoyed her wit and her warmth, as well as her wisdom. So when the Jewish Studies Program invited her to speak here at UW, I knew that you would be in for a treat. Professor Norwich is on the faculty of English and of Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan, where she also serves as the Associate Director of the Frankel Institute for Advanced Judaic Studies. She's a celebrated figure in the world of Yiddish studies, and she's written widely on Yiddish literature. Her publications include a book called The Homeless Imagination in the Fiction of Israel Joshua Singer, as well as articles on authors such as Sholem Aleichem, Sholem Ash, Isaac Besheva Singer, and Esther Kreitman. In addition, she's known for her pathbreaking work on gender and feminist criticism in relation to the Yiddish canon and American Jewish fiction and poetry. Uh, this is the area of her work that I know best because some 15 years ago, we co-edited a book together it's uh, this one, Gender and Text in Modern Hebrew and Yiddish Literature. And this was one of the first books that dealt with uh, writing by and about women in modern Hebrew and Yiddish. Currently, Professor Norwich is completing a new book called A Time for Every Purpose, Jewish Culture in America During the Holocaust. Now, I hardly need to tell you what a successful series the Strom Lectures have been. This is the 20th year in a row that I've attended. And it's been a remarkable experience to see the directions that the lectures have taken over the years and also how they've contributed to the vitality and the intellectual rigor of uh, the growing dynamic field of Jewish studies. The talks themselves have been wonderful occasions from David Stern's distinguished presentations on the history of classic Jewish books to last year's standing room only events where Aaron Rodrigue discussed Sephardic history to the truly earth-shaking moments in Alan Mintz's lecture on popular culture and the shaping of Holocaust memory in America. Some of you may recall the earthquake that took place while Alan was at the podium. <laughs> the books that have emerged from the talks greatly widen the reach of the lectures, and they continue to have sin significant impact. Um, I frequently hear from colleagues at other universities that they include these books on their syllabi. And uh, I know from personal experience how valuable these books are. Uh, for example, I regularly assign my UW students readings from Robert Alter's The Invention of Hebrew Prose. And just this week, I reread Michael Stanislavski's Autobiographical Jews in connection with one of my own research projects. In addition, my daughter tells me that as an undergraduate, um, which happened to be at Michigan, she too was assigned books from the Strom series, including Paula Hyman's Gender and Assimilation in Modern Jewish History and Stephen Zipperstein's Imagining Russian Jewry. I'm sure that Anina Norwich's work on Yiddish in America will make a lively and appealing addition to the list of very accomplished books that have come before hers. Uh, now, as you know, the um, series this year is called Speaking in Tongues, Translating Yiddish in the 20th Century. On Sunday evening, Anita spoke about how Tevye learned to fiddle, and she compared a variety of film adaptations of Shalom Aleichem's Tevye stories. On Thursday, in her third lecture, she will speak on Becoming American, Yiddish in the Golden Land. And tonight, her topic is Remembering the Past in Yiddish. Please join me in welcoming Anita Norwich. Thank you, Naomi. And uh, it's a pleasure to see some of you again and some of you for the first time. And uh, certainly a pleasure to be back here. Many years ago, I got into trouble at an international Yiddish conference for suggesting that Isaac Bashevis Singer wrote primarily for an English-speaking audience and for those who were fairly remote from either the Eastern European world he purported to invoke or the immigrant Jewish American experience. A senior, learned, truly distinguished Israeli scholar suggested that the reason I was making this claim was that I had no access to the shtetl, to Cheder, to Polish, to Warsaw, to traditional Jewish life, to the political revolutions of the 20th century, to the seductive nature of secular knowledge and the newness of modern romantic love. 
quite a miracle that I'm still here. <laughs> I had, in short, never known Isaac Bashevis Singer's world. I replied, I am now sorry to say, in a rather petulant and certainly intimidated way. I lamented that if attendance at a traditional Polish yeshiva and rebellion from it were the requirements for Yiddish scholarship, then most of us in the room were automatically disqualified. I understood this scholar, whom I prefer not to name, uh, I understood this scholar to be putting me in my place by using the exclusionary three Gs of Jewish culture on the basis of geography, generation, and gender, Yiddish culture in its deepest sense was closed to me. Indeed, I had not been there or done that. I had never set foot in Poland. I was born after the war. I could not have gone to yeshiva for obvious reasons. There is something in this incident that encapsulates for me the problem of translating Yiddish into English. What was at stake in this exchange had little to do with the literary reputation of Singer, or Bashevis as he is known in Yiddish, and everything to do with the past, present, and future status of Yiddish and the culture of Eastern European and much of American Jewry. More than raising questions about accuracy or knowledge or fidelity to a text, the act of translation from Yiddish to English seems to hint at the end of a culture by suggesting that Yiddish has no audience or future. Translations from Yiddish may feel like a capitulation to history, hinting at the end of Yiddish culture by suggesting that, at least in the original, these texts will no longer be read by anyone, but will, like their intended audience, disappear. Translation becomes potentially a form of obliteration. Yiddish, in this context, that is the use of Yiddish, can be understood as resistance and translation as an act of collaboration in the destruction of a culture, a betrayal of the language in which it flourished and the millions who spoke it. Yet at the same time, and in apparent contradiction to this view of translation as a kind of violation, the cultural valence of contemporary Yiddish suggests that translation, too, is an act of resistance to history. Increasingly, everything one does with or in Yiddish, speaking, reading, writing, teaching, translation, scholarship, whatever one does in Yiddish, will be understood, or has been understood, as a defiant gesture aimed at preserving the traces of a culture that has undergone startling and dreadful transformations in the last century. Cultural politics imparts an urgency to demands that translators be faithful to the Yiddish originals and fears that they, that is translators rather than readers or writers, are defining the canon of Yiddish literature. In either case, however reluctant we may be to invoke it, the language of the Holocaust is pivotal to the discussion. Collaborators or resistors, Yiddish translators are inevitably measured by daunting standards. There is a popular view of Yiddish as a parochial culture, which I hope we have been disabused of uh, by now, but nonetheless, there is a popular view of Yiddish as a parochial culture tied to a specific past that assimilation and physical devastation have decimated. One of the primary questions raised about Yiddish translation concerns its nature as a Jewish language. How can a Jewish language steeped in Jewish ritual and culture hope to be understood in non-Jewish languages? Isaac Bashevis Singer once came to a YIVO function, a, a function at the New York uh, Yiddish uh, Research Institute. Uh, he came uh, to read a Yiddish story and uh, I was in the audience, and in the middle of the story, he stopped himself. He had a dramatic mode in which uh, I, this, this could happen. But there he was in front of an audience of hundreds, and he stopped himself in the middle of uh, a page uh, of, of the story, and he said, this is too hard for you. <laughs> <laughs>
you will not understand, I need a different story. And what he was saying was that we were unlikely to know Lucian Koidish. That is, we were unlikely to know the Hebrew and Aramaic that was embedded within his Yiddish prose. Um, and therefore, uh, he thought he should switch to a more American and therefore easier story. And indeed, there are obvious differences between saying Rosh Hashunah and saying the new year, between saying Tammuz and summer months. These are actual translations um, that I'm using here. Uh, there's, an, there's an obvious huge difference between saying Shabbos Nachamu and, and I quote, the Sabbath after the holiday of Tisha B'Av in which the Torah portion concerning consolation is read. <laughs> there are similarly obvious differences between the term non-Jews and Goyim, between Shabbos and Shabbat and the Sabbath. One of the tasks of the translator is not only to contextualize, but to convey a literal, physical sense of different ways of perceiving. It is, for many of my students, surprising merely to see the Yiddish alphabet, to imagine moving their heads in a different direction, uh, to know that meaning is conveyed in Yiddish by adding certain dots and dashes under certain letters dots and dashes that are meaningless and in fact barely visible to the English eye. Although such concerns certainly contribute to the anxiety about what is lost in translation, they actually ignore the cosmopolitan, indeed international nature of Yiddish literary production in the past century. Parochial in the sense that all languages and cultures are, which is simply to say that they are written for a particular linguistic community, Yiddish literary culture was always in conversation with the cultures that surrounded it. Modern post-enlightenment Yiddish writers were without exception multilingual, as were the vast majority of their audiences. The history of the Jews in Europe and America and the extent to which Yiddish speakers necessarily adapted other languages, Hebrew, German, Russian, Polish, English, or any others among which they lived. All of this underscores the extent to which a range of literatures and languages inf influenced Yiddish culture. Yiddish may be the literature of a minority, but it is not a minor literature. It is rather in the peculiar position of being a major literature in a minor language. Minor in the sense that the Jews who read it all over the world were a minority everywhere, and could not rely on Yiddish alone. Of necessity, then, Yiddish has always been permeable, open to other literary influences, looking to other languages and traditions in dialogue with them. Ironically, I think, perhaps, the multilingual cultural exchange that has always been the norm in Yiddish may make Yiddish literature peculiarly adaptive to translation, open to the differences of language and culture. It does us absolutely, this is a commercial interruption now. It does us absolutely no good to say Sotnish Kantam of English. It has no flavor in English. Uh, it does, it, Yiddish, it, that is the sentiment that Yiddish loses its unique flavor when it's rendered into English. It certainly changes its tam, its flavor, but that is true of every translation from every language. It also does us no good to say that some things simply cannot be translated. They can, and they must, if we are to take seriously the desire for groups to understand one another and not merely themselves. Let's go back to the important example of Singer himself, who despite abundant evidence of excellent translations of his prose, contributed to the notion that Yiddish is by its nature and context, different from other languages. His Yivo appearance attests to the mystified notion of Yiddish he promulgated. The most telling example of his mystification of Yiddish occurs in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. In this speech, which was only 10 minutes long, uh, Basheb Singer uttered one paragraph in Yiddish. And I'd like you to listen to that paragraph, and I will then um, translate it. 
Der größte Covid, was die schwedische Akademie hat mir umgetan, ist euch an einer Erkennung für Jiddisch. Er sprach von Gules, ohne Land, und Grenzen, nicht gestützt von kein Schimmregierung. Er sprach aus Vermutt gemacht nicht, kein Wörter, Verwuffen, Amnitie, militärische Übungen und Taktik. Er luschen, was ich wen verachtet, zwar von Goye, mit zwar von Gemäste, emanzipierte Jeden. Der Remes ist, er wusste die größte Religie, die haben gepredigt, haben die Jeden im Ghetto praktiziert. Sie haben nicht gehabt, keine größere Freiheit, wir lernen wegen Menschen in menschliche Beziehungen, wo sei im Angriff in teure Talmud, Musa, Kabule. Die Ghetto ist nicht bloß gewesen an Not, von einer Trennung von verwüllter Minorität, und er euch ein größeres Experiment in Schulen, Selbstdisziplin und Humanismus. Rechtlich befinden existieren bis heim zu Tod, nicht gekickt auf der ganzen Brutalität, was ringelt sie erinnert. The great honor that the Swedish Academy has bestowed upon me is also a recognition of Yiddish, a language of exile, without a land, without borders, without the support of any government, a language that barely has any words for weapons, ammunition, military exercises, or tactics, a language that was disdained by both non-Jews and by most emancipated Jews. The truth is that what the great religions preached was practiced by Jews in the ghettos. They had no greater joy than learning about people and human interactions, which they called Torah, Talmud, Musar, ethics, or Kabbalah, mysticism. The ghetto was not only a place of constraint for an oppressed minority, but also a great experiment in peace, self-discipline, and humanism. Traces of it exist until today, despite the enormous brutality that encompasses it. Notice that and notice how he claims that Yiddish has barely any words for weapons or military exercises or tactics or war, and he pronounces this precisely in Yiddish. Right? Of course Yiddish has words for all the horrors of the modern world. But Singer's point, quite explicitly, is that its speakers were innocent of the political, national, cultural obscenities of the 20th century to which they were subject. He is not making a claim about the language, but about the culture and the people who lived it. In effect, these essentializing notions about Yiddish and Jewish culture lament, as did that Israeli scholar with whom I began, they lament the loss of an ideal reader who theoretically and practically does not exist. The interpretive community into which Singer's texts now enter is quite different from this ideal reader. But it is a community Singer knew he was addressing. At least since the 1950s, Singer was not addressing those who knew at first hand the culture he invoked, but rather precisely those who did not. He is so widely read not because he renders the familiar, but because whether through demons or imps or sexual license or realistic descriptions of the past, he emphasizes the strange and unfamiliar. He spoke authoritatively to readers who are so far removed from the Eastern European world, he describes, <coughs> that they have come to long for it. Singer himself was fond of insisting that he never wrote with any reader in mind, though it is very hard to imagine that he was indifferent to the harsh Yiddish criticism to which he was subject or to his adoring English critics. Singer's claim to ignoring his readers in the creative process was disingenuous at best. As is often true of this author's pronouncements about his literary method, in interviews and writing, he took positions that seemed to contradict this claim to authorial innocence. He was insistent about his role in the translation process and the changes he introduced on behalf of the English reader. He was notoriously dissatisfied with most of his translators, changing them frequently, regretting the necessary losses a writer faced in translation, and 
asserting that the editorial process was central to the process of translation. He also sometimes preferred translators who didn't know Yiddish, <laughs> which is an interesting problem. <coughs> in America, when his novels and stories were translated into English, he worked with collaborators who both did and didn't know Yiddish. His revisions were typically so extensive that Singer could claim the English version of his work as a second original, as he called it. He insisted on his role as co-translator. And it's really no wonder that he worked so closely with his translators, since he correctly understood his literary reputation and future would rest on the English texts they helped him produce. Singer's texts and translation have entered into the canon of Jewish literature in America and of American literature. They have been transported into American culture and have been transformed in the process. Perhaps the very best of, a, example of that is a story and a film with which I suspect many of you are familiar. This time, the translation is not just from Yiddish into English, but from short story into film, from prose into song, and from Basheva Singer into Barbara Streisand. I refer, of course, to the once popular Yentl. Um, written in the 1950s, translated and published in English in 1961, and then adapted for stage and screen in the 70s and 80s, the Gilgolim, the various incarnations of Yentl, underscores the importance of considering the intended or imagined audience for Singer's works. Singer hated this film. He wrote a harsh, mock review of it in the form of a self-interview. You know, somebody asks Singer and Singer answers, but he was both of them. Um, uh, he wrote one for the New York Times. He had nothing to do with the film, which may be why he hated it so much. His own screenplay was rejected by Barbara Streisand. Not a good plan. And replaced by one of her own devising, which he then criticized mercilessly. He certainly bears no responsibility for the Americanization of his story. I'd like to show you now it, it, just two minutes of the film's ending. You remember the story of Yentl, right? The, the girl wants to study, dresses as a boy. Can we play it, please? And this is the ending. You'll notice that the Hebrew book is upside down, but... Um, this is on the ship bound for America. And here we see the huddled masses, indeed. Now look at the first sight you have of the back of this person, whose gender is still obscure. Brown cap, long coat, we see nothing. Although I have to say that if at any point in the film of Yentl, you thought that this was a boy, that Barbara Streisand was actually a man, we should really talk after the lecture. <laughs> I have phone numbers I can refer you to. Right. But here, there is an illusion of this ambiguity about gender, but clearly this is a girl. 
the Magen David on the ship. The film ends a lot like Fiddler on the Roof, but unlike Singer's story, en route to America, the golden land where anything is possible, even happiness for a girl who has lived as a boy and who wants to study uh, further. Um, throughout the film, we have been aware that this is a girl in men's clothing. Streisand is at some pains to make it clear that the homoeroticism of the situation in the end only underscores Yentl's femininity, awakening within her the feminine desires, the womanly desires she has long suppressed. Her true nature is to be free to go and do as she wishes. In this film, and only in this film, Yentl is a feminist and an American, two categories that were remote indeed from Singer's aesthetic or philosophical perspective. No one ever accused Singer of being a feminist. Um, what would Yentl have done in America? Singer mockingly asked in that New York Times review I referred to. What would she have done? Worked in a sweatshop 12 hours a day? Would she try to marry a salesman in New York, move to the Bronx or to Brooklyn, and rent an apartment with an icebox and a dumbwaiter? End quote. In deflating the movie in this way, Singer reasserts Yentl's desire to learn and also says quite explicitly that there were plenty of yeshivas in Poland and in Lithuania where she could have studied if she had continued to dress in drag. Singer's story is radically different from this film. In his story, Yentl retains the identity of Anshul, the young man she has become in the story. She rejects that is, Yentl as Anshul rejects the love of Avigdor, the study partner with whom she has fallen in love, to whom she has finally re revealed herself as a woman, and who now imagines a life with the friend he too has come to love. Yentl the Yeshiva Bacha, Yentl the Yeshiva Boy, is a story about desire and transgression and identity. It includes all the elements of a sensational and controversial Besheva story. Cross-dressing, androgyny, homoerotic desire between two apparent men and between two women, homosexual love. Where the film only hints at these, keeping the distinctions and the identity of male and female quite clear, the story, as I will illustrate in a minute, especially in its Yiddish version, the story insists on blurring these distinctions. There are some telling differences between the Yiddish and English text, which is in most things faithful to the original, except in the things that I'm about to uh, show you. Let me offer a few related examples. In the first one, um, uh, we, we have uh, the scene where Anshul, Yentl dressed as Anshul, is developing the plan to marry Hadass. And he says in the Yiddish, right here, the Hadas is a kusher besule. Was weist sie von Manslei? Mekona za eine lang nagen. Zwo, sie, Jentel, is eucher besule. Aber sie weist das Sach von der Gemeure und von Zuhören sich zu die Mansbielische Schmusen. Um, uh, Hadas was a virgin. What did she know about men? A girl like that could be deceived for a long time. To be sure, Anshul too was a virgin, but she knew a lot about such matters from the Gemara and from hearing men talk. You see the difference between Yentl is Oycha Basula, Yentl is a virgin, Anshul is a virgin. Right. I'll give you some other examples of this that are even better. Um, in, in, in Yiddish, the texts the text reminds us that it's Yentl whose virginity is in question in the Yiddish text. Um, in the English one, there's a slide over into Anshul, except Anshul is a she, which is odd, uh, to say the least. Um, here's a related example taken from the scene following the wedding night. Remember the wedding night from the film? <laughs> 
uh, Yentl dressed as Anshul um, gets Hadas drunk uh, and uh, spills um, wine onto the bedsheet in, in, as proof um, uh, that they have been together. But listen to the um, Yiddish and then uh, to the English. Fartog, this is the day after the wedding, Fartog, then in the Machateniste und seire Kommis are reingefallen zu Hussen Kalle in Schlafstub und are abgerissen von unter Hadassen das Lalach sich eben zu zeigen, sie der Mann hat sich mit ihr behoften. It's a great word if you know Yiddish. Sie haben gefunden euch von Lalach Flecken von Blut und das Gesindel ist geworden hoffedig. Sie haben gekuscht die Kalle und ihr gewünschten Maseltot, denn noch Zenen sei ja Reus mit dem Lalech und Reusen und getanzt damit akusche Tanz und frisch äh, und in, in frisch angefallenem Schnee. Here's the sentence. Anschul hat gehat gefunden a Vortel, wir soi ebe zu reißen bei Hadassen die Besulis. Die Besulim. Right. Let me give you the English one. At daybreak, Anshul's mother-in-law and her band descended upon the marriage chamber and tore the bedsheets from beneath Hadas to make sure the marriage had been consummated. When traces of blood were discovered, the company grew merry and began kissing and congratulating the bride. Then brandishing the, the sheet, they flocked outside and danced a kosher dance in the newly fallen snow. Anshul had found a way to deflower the bride. What I'm looking at here is the distinction between Anshul hat gefunden a fortel via soi ibe zu reißen by hadassen de psolim, which literally, if I were to translate this literally, which I would never do, I, I, I hasten to add, um, for an English audience, but if I were to translate this uh, literally, um, I would be uh, uh, saying, uh, Anshul found a way, uh, by we, b found a means by which to tear Hadassah's virginity. To tear Hadassah's virginity. This is rather more graphic than the poetic deflowering of the bride, right? And it's a lot more graphic than spilling wine on a bedsheet, right? Um, through almost all of the English text, we are reminded that Anshul is a she, a woman merely posing as a man. I'm going back to this slide now. Whenever we refer to Anshul here, he's referred to as Er. Er, im, 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 er, right? He, Anshul, he. Anshul was thirsty, he went to get a glass of water. Anshul couldn't sleep, he was excited. The Yiddish, uh, sorry, the English switches that completely. That night, Anshul didn't sleep a wink, her throat was parched. Her brain worked feverishly. Her forehead burned. Right? Her stomach throbbed. She had sealed a pact with Satan. That is, it's precisely the opposite of what the Yiddish text does, of what, what, what Basheva Singer does in the Yiddish. In the Yiddish, he says, Anshul, he. That is, the transformation into Anshul, the man, is complete in the Yiddish. It's incomplete in the English uh, translation, and it's entirely obscured. Uh, in, um, in the English uh, film. Why? I was hoping you would ask. Um, what's the effect of these changes? I would suggest that with each distancing from Bashevis's original Yiddish text, that is, from the move from Yiddish to English, and then from the move from English to stage and to screen, we perceive an increasing anxiety about transgression an increasing unwillingness, unwillingness to defy the supposed norms of the community. This, this is exactly the inverse of what we normally associate with Yiddish. We think Yiddish is you know, folksy and you know, a little more conservative, but it is precisely in the Yiddish that Bashevis is able to take these uh, transgressive leaps. Um, Bashevis' urge to test the limits is set in the late 19th century Eastern European world where the boundaries between male and female, Jew and non-Jew, here and there are clear. For Bashevis, in Yiddish, allowing Yentl to cross over into Anshul to become, in effect, this uh, disguise that she takes on, 
that crossing over means allowing her to choose her own way, allowing her to be free of the identity imposed upon her from without. And freedom for Yentl means freedom within Judaism, in study, for which there is some limited but present traditional sources. By law, she should not dress as a man. She should certainly not marry a woman. But who in the modern Jewish world can fault her for wanting to learn? In typical form, Bashevis affirms both the desire to study and to be a Jew in all senses of the word, and the desire to break free of the strictures of the law and its customs. The situation is strikingly different for the English reader and viewer, beset not so much by the urge to test the limits of identity, but rather by the need to define and maintain a community, a community of readers, of Jews, of men and women, a community that seems to be at its end. Yentl cannot, in the English, cross over into Anshul, because to allow that is to allow the possibility in America of crossing over into another identity. One of the ways in which a community defines itself is by keeping distinctions clear, by highlighting its differences from others. The fear of miscegenation or gay marriage or intermarriage are all current and dramatic illustrations of a similar anxiety about group, ang about group identities. And it's a similar assertion of clear distinctions us and not them, uh, as one way of maintaining that group identity. Who is in and who is out of the group matters most when groups are insecure about their own identities. I want to show you another example of a comparable kind of sexual and identity transgression by a female poet I suspect many have not heard of. Um, uh, I, I want to look at a poem by the poet Anna Margolin. Do you know this poet? Please, please do. Um, Margolin is a perfect place to start in any examination of the transgressive nature of Yiddish. She was a divorcee who moved around a lot and left her infant son in the custody of his father. She had many lovers, all of them public. She wrote under a pseudonym. She was known as an intellectually aggressive woman and in later years was a recluse reported to be too obese and too severely depressed to emerge from her apartment. Here is a poet whose challenge to fixed identities is really profound. It is examined most explicitly in this poem, a poem called Ich bin gewein am Orla Yingling, whose very title announces that identity is permeable and unfixed. Yingling is not a word in Yiddish. It's a combination of yingi, which means boy, and jung, which means young. And, in a, and, and it's got this ambiguous ling uh, uh, diminutive add-on to the end of it. In a language whose nouns are gendered, yingl may be either masculine or neuter. We, we say dos yingl, which is a neuter uh, noun, rather than der yingl, than the masculine noun, <laughs> just as madel is dos madel. So that at the outset of this poem, we have a signal of the problem of claiming any stable rules or essential characteristics governing gender. Is yingling to be translated as young, a youth, a young person, a lad, which is masculine, uh, which I've seen but is, is perhaps too gendered? It's certainly unclear about gender, yingling, spe specifically unclear about gender. And in addition to transgressing linguistically, it invokes sexual transgressions as well. Once I was young, heard Socrates in porticos, my bosom friend, my lover, had the finest chest in Athens. This is a male lover. Um, the poem, now known primarily in English translation, begins as though it were looking back, perhaps nostalgically, to the speaker's youth. But it is uh, clearly a youth that uh, she could never have experienced, both Greek and Roman, early Christian, um, uh, male and female, defying time and space and sexuality. The speaker lays claim to each of these shifting identities. 
but she never claims, if you look at this poem, she never claims the identity either of a woman or of a Jew. That is, this is really an attempt to transcend the limitations of uh, evident and obvious identity. Um, the two English translations struggle, and I think rather successfully, to maintain those tensions that are absolutely clear simply in the title of, um, uh, of the Yiddish. But to return uh, more directly uh, uh, to the problem of multiple translations and the differences they make, I'd like to offer one final example. This is a famous story written by Yudlame Peretz, I.L. Peretz, one of the most beloved of Yiddish writers, and along with Shalom Aleichem and Mendel Amoychus Farim, one of the klassike, the classical Yiddish writers. Peretz was even more popular in his own day than Singer has been in ours. Many of his works have been translated many times in the centuries since they appeared. And my understanding of translation has been influenced by these translations and also by Peretz's own revision of his first published work. In 1888, he published a long autobiographical poem called Monish, the name of the character. And uh, in that poem, there are two lines that say, Anders wollt mein Lied geklungen, soll vergoyem goyisch singen. My song or my poem would sound completely different if I were singing for non-Jews in a non-Jewish language. That's the essential question of Yiddish literature. Right? What difference does it make that it's written in Yiddish? How would it sound different if it were to be uh, written in French or Polish or German or English uh, or Hebrew? Peretz, in this uh, version of Monish in 1888, went on to lament the seeming poverty of jargon, jargon, the, the, the word that was used for Yiddish disparagingly. He claimed that Yiddish had, this is the most famous Yiddish writer uh, of, of, uh, of his time. Uh, Yiddish hat kein rechten Klang, kein rechten Ton. It has no true uh, note, no proper tone. He claimed that it lacked a vocabulary for love or emotion, and that it was most apt for uttering witticisms or expressions of suffering. This sounds a lot like Singer's claim almost a century later that Yiddish has no words for weapons or war, or I might add way too many words for fool. <laughs> by 1908, 20 years later, by 1908, when Peretz republished the poem Monish, he erased these earlier harsh lines. He erased uh, the idea that um, Yiddish uh, couldn't um, speak of love um, and the idea that he would be much better off if he could write in a Goyish language, in a non-Jewish language. The change, those 20 years change, um, the 20 years difference between 1888 and 1908 um, had actually been good to uh, Yiddish literary endeavors. Yiddish literature had taken off largely under the tutelage of Peretz, but it had not been good to Polish Jewry. There were, in fact, Yiddish publications on both sides of the Atlantic. There were more of them. They were better than they had been earlier. And Peretz, by then, by 1908, had already become the guru of Yiddish literature. The 20 years between 1888 and 1908 had been frightening ones for European Jews. You'll remember the massive emigration to America was in full swing. The Dreyfus Affair had rocked Europe, as had the shocking Kishinev pogroms. The protocols of the elders of Zion had appeared, and the first Russian Revolution had failed. Peretz himself saw the need to translate his earlier Yiddish sentiments into current Yiddish sentiments. If we learn anything from this internal translation, it is the need for different renditions of the same texts into different contexts. Just as we have had multiple translations of Homer, or the Bible, or Tolstoy, or Flaubert, so have we had multiple translations of Peretz, each responding to the different contexts in which they were written. Um, I, I, I want to, to show you one very specific example of this. Uh, taken from Peretz's most famous story, Bunche Schweig. 
This is where people are supposed to nod. Thank you. Um, uh, bunch of, uh, the story that is, that is uh, most often uh, translated as Bunch of the Silent. But in fact, as its most recent translator has reminded us, the title is not Bunch of the Silent. The title is Bunch of Schweig, which is an imperative. It's a command. It doesn't say Bunch is silent, Bunch schweigt, but Bunch schweig, which means Bunch be silent. Bunch silence, right? It's a command and a very strong one. But we don't know whose command it is. Is it the command of God? Is it the command of the angels in heaven to which he, uh, where he appears? Is it the command of Bunch's oppressors who say, just shut up and take it? In any case, Bunch, as you'll recall, stays silent until the very end of his heavenly trial. After being abused by his parents, left an orphan, uh, by his wife, or his, his stepchildren, uh, by the community at large, and he has been silent and suffering through it all. He comes up to the heavenly tribunal, and um, uh, he is silent even there. And then, in again, one of the most evocative lines in, in Yiddish literature, when the judge addresses him with great love, Bunche is offered anything his heart desires. Right? What would you like? Right? So here you are at the heavenly tribunal, what would you like? I once made the mistake of asking this in a class of undergraduates, one of whom said a Humvee. <laughs> Another one said 70 virgins. It was, uh, I have not repeated this in an undergraduate class as a question, but you can see the drama. Think in your heads, you are offered anything in the world. At least ask for help. At least ask for peace. At least ask for, right? But Bunch's response, uh, uh, to the to the request uh, is nu oiba zoi shmechel bunche vilich take alle tog you can all say it with me if you've memorized it as a child vilich take alle tog in der fri a heise bulke mit frische putte what I would really like every, it's not translated on these on this slide what I would really like every morning is a hot roll with fresh butter. Now, is this the expression of the humble, simple Jew who would live happily if only he were left alone and had the necessities of life? Right? Here is the simple request. Or, quite to the contrary, is it the expression of a Jew who is simple, but so simple that he lacks all imagination and volition, unable to imagine anything greater than a hot roll with butter. But this is not actually the end of the end of the story. Here, in fact, in eight translations, is its final two lines. Right? The final two lines of the story says, Dayanim and Malachim hab marabkilosti kept fashemt dekatege hotzir tzulacht. You see the eight translations here. The question here is not who is right or wrong, but the varying ways in which the translators have understood this story. The earliest translation, Wiener's, is close, but drooped is a little stronger than aropkilost, which means dropped. Um, uh, the next one that you see, uh, the court and the angels look down a little ashamed the prosecutor laughed, right? Everything is kind of diminishing their culpability. Uh, the next translation adds this completely unnecessary exclamation point and then aloud. It's not enough that he laughs, but it kind of bursts in there as uh, Samuels is pretty close, broke into a laugh. But here, Moshe Spiegel, who, who takes considerable liberties, the judges and angels were stunned I don't know where stunned comes from. It doesn't come from the Yiddish. Um, but the d judges and angels were stunned. The heavenly informer burst into laughter. Um, they, this one has a, a bitter laugh, right? That is, 
each of, uh, uh, each of these translations, it seems to me, are judgments on the accusers. They're saying they shouldn't be accusing. They're a little coarse in their rendition. Halkin understands the story very differently. Halkin sees it, and I'm reading this from just these two lines. Halkin sees the story as an indictment of Bunche and an indictment of the heavenly tribunal itself. What do we do with a heavenly court that rewards this kind of radical passivity, this kind of radical silence? We cannot, Peretz and, Hirsch and Halkin are saying, be simply passive and expect to be rewarded in heaven. That is not the Jewish way, which places greater emphasis on this world than on the next. Halkin's ending, like the others, is enigmatic, but in the opposite direction. He gives us a simple, unadorned, spare declarative sentence. The prosecutor doesn't burst into laughter. Nobody's stunned. The prosecutor simply laughs. Written for a different, more secure, and less defensive Jewish audience, this translation returns us to Peretz's original tone. In Peretz's day, ironically, the story was not intended, certainly, for a secure Jewish audience, but rather for one that needed to be rallied, needed to stand up for itself. What both views of Buncha have in common is the knowledge that Buncha is not the model to be followed, but precisely the opposite a model to be rejected in favor of a more assertive, demanding Jewish presence. As its etymology suggests, translation is a form of transgression, a carrying over from one place to another. When Streisand carry carried over the story of Yentl into an American musical film, she muted the bolder transgressions of the Yiddish. When translators struggled with the meaning of Margolin's yingling, they sought a way to convey its ambiguity. When most translators turned to parrots, they muted again the assertiveness, the call to arms that he was really issuing. Ironically, in each case, it is the Yiddish text that is more radical, more willing to explore the various possibilities of identity, more assertive of the individual, more prepared to revolt. English has its eye on a different consumer in a different milieu. This observation is neither a disparagement of the English nor a plea for the Yiddish. Actually, maybe it's a little bit of a plea for the Yiddish, but ever so slightly. Um, it's rather an assertion, much like Singer's and Margolin's, of differences. It's also an acknowledgment, like Peretz's, of the requirements posed by different contexts. Let me conclude by returning to the three Gs with which I began. Bashevis and Margolin and Peretz and every other modern writer of Yiddish knew that geography, generation, and gender mattered. But they also knew that time passes and Jews wander and translation matters too. In the end, Bashevis was right in asserting that in much of his work, he'd produced two originals for two different audiences. We should look at all Yiddish translations as producing a different original rather than as being a pale imitation of the original. Our privileged task is to be both of those audiences and to read these texts both in English and most certainly in Yiddish as well. Thank you. <laughs>